welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 160. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man himself, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. I mean, what an exciting show we've got for our listeners today. It's a real uh, joy to revisit this individual, isn't it? It is. I think it's safe to say that we've been deep into the Moonshot archives, haven't we, Mark? That's right. Today, listeners, we are bringing you Zaha Hadid, an individual that we've referenced many, many, uh, maybe even three many's <laughs> times <laughs> throughout the last uh, over 100 shows, Mike. Today, episode 160, we're actually revisiting episode number 50, so 110 episodes ago. Right. And for those of you who don't know Zaha Hadid, uh, world famous architect, she was born in in the early 50s, uh, originally hailing from Baghdad and then ended up uh, moving with her family uh, to the UK and overcame pretty much every sort of challenge you could as an immigrant woman studying to be an architect and then going on to be an entrepreneur and founding her own company. Oh, and by the way, you know, in that journey, she managed to create some of the most epic signature buildings In the history of humankind, this is a lady that deserves our consideration, right, Mark? Yeah, she really does. And for those listeners who maybe recognize her name, perhaps you've heard Mike or myself reference her on the show. Maybe you've read her name in uh, articles online, Architectural Digest even. Go and just Google her name and check out the buildings that she's done because I think it's fair to say, Mike, that they're brave, courageous, creative. I think sometimes we'll recognize a few of her buildings. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll just be so surprised with what they look like. I mean, they're so original. They are. And so just on her output alone, she deserves our consideration. We need to ask ourselves, what can we learn from Zaha? But beyond that, this is a woman who's fought uh, the good fight and overcome what many of us would not even face in a lifetime. And she's done it uh, tenfold. What a remarkable woman. I I noticed, Mark, that she has so much to, to teach us through her resilience, through her thinking different. I would say that she is right up there with uh, the likes of Simon Sinek, who uh, so sort of constant referrals, cross references to Zaha um, throughout the course of our 160 shows. I mean, I just can't stop talking about this lady. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're totally right. I think there's a real lesson that we can all glean from Zaha. There's a great. In insight into how she's essentially a founder, splitting her time across multiple disciplines, wearing a number of different hats, while always maintaining a level of focus and creativity. And as you've just said, that resilience and this ability for her to never give up, despite mm. having some unbelievable challenges that you and I wouldn't experience. I think this idea of no compromisation as well as stoicism, really does place her right up in the moonshot archive of individuals that we love learning out loud from, doesn't she? She does. And I will take it one step further in saying what we have in store as we uh, look at the work of Zaha and her thoughts, her ideas, her thinking, is that she takes resilience to another level. She is really has a lesson to teach us in that you know, that common saying, if it doesn't kill you, it only makes you stronger. She is the David Goggins of architecture. She has so much to give. And I'm delighted to return to her, to her work and to her thinking. So without any further ado, let's jump in to the world of Zaha Hadid. Chad Owen, I am ready to rock and roll. Where do we kick this off? Yeah. And so, um, Zaha is a Rocky born and she's still got a pretty heavy accent. So some of these clips, Mike and I will help kind of put some more context on what she's saying. Uh, if you don't have the the luxury of going back and, and re-listening to them, but yeah, we've got uh, some really great introductory clips about Zaha and her work and someone that we have heard from before on this show uh, talking about here. So here's uh, here's an introduction to Zaha. She's regarded as one of the industry's best. 
was the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize, architecture's highest honor. One of the most prolific and lauded architects of our time. In the last 10 years, there's been a very, I think, ambitious project by many cities. Architecture became really a way to represent cities. Therefore, the ambition has heightened. She's an engineer as well as an architect. That hasn't in any way detracted her beautiful aesthetic sense, but it has given body to her work as well. She knows what she's doing. Zaha recognized early on that the computer could be used as a, as a drawing tool. It could help you invent new forms and shapes. What an extraordinary contribution she, she has made to architecture. It is really amazing to kind of be able to create a, kind of a, a space. If you have a concept, it could apply to many layers, to a very small thing and to a very large thing. that kind of architectural imagination, that kind of determined drive, and that kind of will to persist. The will to persist, that is so Zaha. And when I think of how that relates to the founder's journey, or even if you're a corporate executive, like seeing things through, like that's what it really takes. Hey, Chad. Yeah. And this interesting uh, description of her as an engineer and architect and artist this kind of Renaissance woman archetype, if you will, is very interesting and something that we've seen across many of the people that we've profiled is that they're not, some of them are singularly focused on one thing that they're doing and others actually, uh, you know, split their time and attention and, and, and focus in, in, in these cross disciplines. And I think she's definitely someone that has benefited from dabbling in all of those areas. I think what she got known for at first when she was in school in the UK was the striking abstractness of many of her drawings and diagrams mm. that, that to many people there looked more like art than like architectural plans and designs. And so uh, it's really interesting to see how she, that design and artistic aesthetic you can see in all of her buildings yes. uh, because they are so strikingly unique. But then like the art, the engineer inside of her too, make sure that it, you know, that it can withstand the weather and earthquakes and it'll actually stand up when you, when you build it. Yeah. And, and that's very much, uh, this idea of Renaissance thinking of this, this multidiscipline, uh, approach to the world. And it's certainly, it's certainly, I think was something that the industry and her peers recognized about her. And this next clip that we have is actually from Norman Foster, who we featured two shows ago. And this is a very, um, this is a wonderful opportunity to hear what her colleagues thought of Zaha Hadid. Everybody knows that Zaha was a fantastic architect. And, and in a way, you never take that for granted. But it's a, it's a given. For me... Zaha was also a very dear friend. One tremendous disappointment is that I was never able to tell her an insight from one of her very special clients. She'd done a house for him, this extraordinary house in the forest in Russia. It was the only house that she'd done. I met this individual by chance at the dinner party. And he was saying, look, you know, this is what she promised and this is what she delivered. It's an extraordinary resolution of this futuristic image and the built reality. Zaha, the futurist, dynamic architect of the future, yeah, the Zaha, the futurist. <laughs> it's it's not yeah, it's not many times you hear architects 
referred to as futurists, but I think it's a really fantastic way to think about and understand how she thought about not just how things were built and designed, but kind of the purpose of architecture was really to move forward how people interacted with with space and how cities uh, functioned. Uh, I think that idea of, of futurism and pushing things beyond where you think that discipline can go was was really what she was driving forward. And I think mm-hmm. is a big, as Norman says, a big reason why she was, you know, is is owed all of the accolades that that she that she got. Yeah. And I think that you have to be so brave to bring in usher in the new because there's so much risk. And I think this is what we can learn from Zaha. She she sort of you can see her almost delighting in the risk of creating something wildly different. And in fact, you know, you mentioned it earlier, like often people would look at uh, her plans and say, that's impossible. If you watch any of the documentaries on her, they'll often bring in the engineers who, particularly in the early days when she would bring the plans, they would just be like, nah, that, that, <laughs> that can't be done. But yeah, you want to build that using what kind of material? Glass? Yeah. No yeah. way. And she was so resilient. She was so like Lady Gaga. You know, she was courageous, relentless. And uh, this next clip is gives us a little bit of insight into her world about how she built the unbuildable. In 2004, you became the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize, which is sort of like the Oscars of the architectural world. And the words to introduce you were, her architectural career has not been traditional or easy. How would you characterize your journey so far? I think, you know, there was a, there's certain parts you take in your career. And, you know, at the time when I finished school, I mean, you know, I was you know, very young and I, you know, you make a certain decision uh, and away you go. But I really thought, even when I was in school, that there was an, kind of a, a glimpse that there could be another kind of world, you know, in terms of what you build. And, um, well, uh, naively or not, I took that decision that to pursue something which required a tremendous amount of research and hoping for a level of invention. And uh, it was very difficult. And I think, you know, it was no, no one I'm very accustomed to, to women architects, with, first within the profession and later within the field. So that was another difficulty. But also the difficulty was I was a foreigner. You know, I was a foreigner in the UK, uh, you know, and uh, although I've lived here now most of my life uh, there. Um, so that was another difficulty. Uh, but it was really because of the 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 extremeness of the work, you know, that but one had to kind of fight. Uh, and of course, these fights makes you not necessarily uh, cynical or whatever. It just makes you tougher, you know, and you, you have certain beliefs and it strengthens your beliefs. And I think it was an important, although at the time, difficult journey, but it was important. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you're famous for designing these buildings that um, it, to others are the stuff of dreams. It, they cannot possibly exist in reality. And some even said that your designs were outright unbuildable. In Hong Kong, actually. So you must be referring to your 1983 project, uh, oh, the, Hong the Peak. Hong Kong Peak, yes. Right, which was sort of a, a spa and a sports yeah. complex. Well, it was, a, you know, it was a kind of a, a club uh, in a way. But that in that pro- the project we did, we thought... It should be more like a civic building. I mean, it, it's, an, it's a nice idea. There was a, a lot of occupation at the time of dealing with the metropolis that you have, you, you have a place of release. You know, you release your, you know, you relax and, you know, whatever. The thing is because, first, the way they were drawn, they were not uh, traditional drawings, the way they were looked. So when people saw these kind of beams flying around, they thought, you know, it's not possible to do. But actually, that was project was easy to build than many of the other projects we actually took on later. Wow. She, she's got this whole thing, Chad, where everything that keeps most of us down, all the blows that we take trying to make our dreams come true, it's almost like she's like, I get stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing this idea, pushing to the extremes actually strengthens her her positions. I think we've got some more clips along these lines, but I, I would encourage everyone to, to Google Hong Kong Peak, P-E-A-K, Zaha Hadid. You'll see these drawings that, that the interview is referring to. 
they look kind of like Picasso or Cubist paintings, like not like architectural uh, drawings that you would submit for to an engineer to figure out if you can build it or, or, or not. And it's really interesting. Like she was kind of even ahead of her own time. She, she's talking here about, well, all the other buildings that we made were actually harder than this one. So, it, you know, to me, this constant like looking around the next corner and then looking around that corner, that kind of thinking, I think is how she was able to break through into this like dreamlike world that, that the interviewers mentioning here, like she's not, she's not someone that starts with kind of the ground truth and reality as it is today. She's like, go, she's thinking and going way into the future. And then she's like, okay, well, what's the future of the future? <laughs> like I want to build that. <laughs> and, 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 what, what I'm take what I'm getting at, what I'm taking away from this is that that's, that's actually a really interesting insight into how we could put ourselves into that 10 X or moonshot mindset, because many of us kind of look at, we, we do a lot of research and we kind of survey competition and what's going on today, but that may actually not get us to where we need to go. We can we need to take extreme viewpoints and then we need to take extreme viewpoints from those extreme viewpoints. And then that, that's how we're actually <laughs> gonna, gonna get there. So I, I'm really encouraged by, by her and just her willingness and, and comfort to just push very far, like beyond the next horizon. So how do you think we can use this idea of pushing yourself to the edges, uh, encountering pushback and disappointment and it making you stronger, Chad? Like, how do we make that turn for those of us who are like, oh, I'm trying to do something great. You know, it's very easy to get fed up with things because you've just been trying and trying. How, what is the turn that she uses and how, what could we use to sh make that shift? I think from her, her ability, like this grit and resilience comes from her life experience. She mentioned, I'm an immigrant. I'm a woman. I think her constantly persevering through that built the resilient, eth you know, work ethic that, that she has. So in, in some ways I'm kind of saying, well, you just got to push through the hard work to, to build the resiliency. And that seems maybe a bit like a cop out of an, of an answer, but I think she's not someone that so stubbornly stuck to her opinions where she didn't allow outside influence or her ideas to be tested. Cause you know, she still had to get approvals and had to, you know, go by the engineers. And so, but she was willing to put out those extreme ideas and not kind of keep them to herself mm. And because she kind of let those extreme ideas play out in kind of public discourse. She's able to kind of slowly over time, win people over to her side and being like, well, actually maybe, well, let's try it. <laughs> let's see if we can do it. Mm. Okay. So it seems like this deliberate choice to put things out there, to make yourself vulnerable is almost interrelated with becoming stronger and therefore more confident and bolder in your vision. And it's almost, I see it as some sort of snowball effect that she built. Mm -hmm. She, she, from, you know, being an immigrant, uh, being a woman, trying to come with radical new thinking into a conservative field, every step of the way, she was fearless in seeking interaction and feedback and, she just got battle hardened. That's, that's how I see that process evolving. Do, 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 do you think, do you think that's how it worked? Yeah. Well, and we've, we've got a great clip here. Uh, this very next one, uh, uh, she's been able to make the most when she can't control her own destiny. So rather than get fed up or, or give up, she instead turns there's that stoic idea of the obstacle is the way mm. where the thing in which you're struggling against is actually the way that you will get through it. And I think sh she's definitely kind of a, maybe as an unknowing, uh, uh, participant in, in that. Stoic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but here, but he, he, here she is talking about making the most when you can't control your destiny. 
Zaha Hadid is one of the most interesting architects in the world. She is sometimes called architecture's one and only diva. She's a leading member of the avant-garde of architecture. She won acclaim at age 33 for her design of the Peak Club in Hong Kong. Her most famous work to date is probably the Vitra Firehouse in Germany, but that may change. She's getting lots of attention for her design for the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. I am pleased to have her here to talk about what she is doing. There was a time. <laughs> when you were a young architect, you designed the Peak Club, got lots of attention, never built. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as an architect, you, know, you, you don't have complete control of your destiny. That was one of the frustrations of this profession. Um, I won the Peak Club at, literally at the time um, Margaret Thatcher went to China and that whole thing with Hong Kong kind of uh, vanished and um, the whole market collapsed. And so we always see that as kind of the, are the reason for these things, but we have no control of political situations. And and of course, when I won the peak, I mean, when I for a day they did not know who it was who won it. They never heard of me. Yeah. There was a guy. They called me at Mr. Hadid, and I when they discovered it was a woman, there was a bit of kind of fluffy going on. Uh, but um, we don't have a control of that situation, and I think that there is, there still remains a, a slight um, cloud. Uh, which is dissipating over women architects. Because I'm not sure why. It's dissipating now. Well, I think it's, it's yeah. I think there are more women in the scene. It's not seen as a kind of a, such such a strange thing. Uh, they're very good. Many you know. So yeah, of course they, they should be. I mean, why? Oh, absolutely. Why do you think that it was a male preserve for so long? Um, I really, I mean, people ask me this all the time. I have no idea. It doesn't make any, I mean, I'm not saying it's a, yeah. it's an interesting question because I actually don't, don't have a particular explanation for it. I think it's not just the, uh, the thing with architecture is that the profession is mostly male, but also the literary industries are male dominated. I mean, whether the contractors world or the developers world or whatever it may be, uh, it is, you know, like the trade is mostly men, but I, I think it will change like anything else, you know. Hmm. I, I love her pragmatic view on things. Like even when discussing these great challenges, she's like, yeah, it was tough, but I just kept going. Like it does, it's, she's not, um, I don't know what the word is, but she's not dripping in this highly emotional hands in the air. Ah, oh, you won't believe it. Stoic. This is all about, yeah, stoic. I just got on with it. Yeah. I can't control these things. So I'm just going to deal with it and do, do, what I can take, take charge of the things I can control and really push for them. So she's like, well, no one can tell me how to design something. So I'm going to put out all my crazy ideas and maybe one of them will stick. Yeah. And, and don't you find this idea of uh, one of the, uh, of just worrying about the things that you control and worrying a lot less about things that you cannot control. I have found this to be a really powerful thought that I, I th actually, I could do a better job of remembering that. Oh, so in, in a way, Zaha, Zaha is reminding me like, dude, just focus on what you do and what you can control. Right. Yeah. I mean, you and I were talking about a specific work thing that's been going on and yeah, we could, we could get upset and him and haw, but ultimately it's something that was, you know, not our choosing someone decided to go in a different direction and we have to make the best of that. Yeah. I mean, we could waste, we could waste the rest of the week and complain and get <laughs> upset and sad and drink away our sorrows, but what good is that going to do us, Mike? Yeah. 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 And, and also like, uh, you win some, you lose some, but the winners keep going. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this resilience and grit that is built up over time of this constant pursuit of, of your, your dreams and desires when it comes to your, your profession and your work. It's, it's a really strong message that I think, I don't want to say it's solely in the realm of the women that we have profiled on the show, but it's certainly overrepresented that like of going, thinking of Martha and Oprah and Lady Gaga and now Zaha, they, they all really exemplify this relentlessness and, and grittiness mostly due to all of the, all of the things that are stacked against them uh, be, because of their, their race or where they're from or, or their gender. It's, it's really, it's really an interesting quality for me to kind of tie together between all of them. Mm. Mm. Isn't it funny though, this, this 
this individual, Zaha Hadid, has come up with these wildly creative, uh, futuristic, uh, memorable architectural designs and buildings and this massive legacy around her work. And then what we're finding is there is this stoic resilience that is maybe her biggest gift for us to learn from. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's like so cool. And that's one of the reasons on our 50th anniversary uh, here, Chad, why I love this show, because you are finding in, you know, we're on our 50th moment of discovering that the great work people have done has always got an underlying of behaviors and habits and rituals and mental models. And resilience is certainly one of them. Where I think we go next level, Chad, is when you think about her, is that she, for all her creative talents, doesn't see herself as the sage in the tower, dreaming up ideas and passing it to her assistant, say, go make me this building. Uh, she's actually got some great thinking, what it takes in terms of a group of people to make something special happen. So let's have a listen to Zaha Hadid on the idea of teamwork. Sorry, and, and also, I'm, I'm always believed in teamwork. So <clears throat> it's not that, you know, there's kind of the hand of the master and then the others will work it out. It doesn't work like that. It works like, you know, a group of people as a team come together, they put ideas together and we test them out and see what works best. And also, it's not that, you know, as I said, it's not the master and the other people. It's, you know, it's more what we all bring to the table. As far as I'm concerned is that the effort of all the people involved in the teams is what matters uh, than, you know, the idea of one single person. I have, of course, the privilege of the right of veto. I can say I don't like it. I mean, people think I'm being very frivolous, but, uh, you know, but I don't like it means it's not right as far as I'm concerned. And, but there's arguments all the time between especially me and the senior staff. And, and, and I think, but, but of course, you know, I always want to push the idea as far as possible to get a very good result. And that's my ambition. I mean, I've spent a lot of time doing this because, not because there's some sort of, I mean, when I said art 30 years ago, I never thought I'll be one. No, no. You know, I'll, I'll do anything. I just, I was more, I really thought when I was in school that there was another way of doing things and that, the trip, and I believed in progress. And I think that if we do enough research and, and, and we, we can push the envelope and we can get better results. And that's what I was wanted to do. Hmm. Yeah, there's this interesting, I, I have this mental picture in, I think her studio is over 400, maybe even close to 500 people today. You know, there's like an impassioned group of, of architects around maybe some models or printouts of, of, of designs. I'm sure they're using 3d printers now in Zaha is there like in a very Steve jobs, like way, like, I don't think it's good enough. And it's maybe that's true, but I think really what she's trying to push the team to do is, is just to make it better. Like it may have been really great. Uh, to begin with, but this idea of pushing the idea as far as possible um, is a very interesting leadership model and something that we have seen in in others. We don't maybe have kind of the in depth uh, kind of anecdotes, you know, from uh, biographers that were talking about Steve Jobs, where he kind of comes off as a bit of a jerk. I, I think Zaha is maybe a little bit more. Uh, just as firm, but maybe in a gentler <laughs> kind of way. Yeah. The velvet hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think what you sensed already is when she was having her right of veto and saying, I don't like it. That was code for push further. Like it wasn't so much her personal whim. She, it was a challenge. Yeah, I know you can do better. I, or right. I know we, the team can do better. Right. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, when you reflect on this idea that she had of almost art, artistic, creative first, architecture second, when she was creating visions of the future. I mean, you heard in some of those clips, people just like, I can't believe that is a building. Like, that's impossible. She made the impossible happen. And um, having the, the, the courage for that vision was a big part of her, her leadership. The second thing 
was she embodied like she would make a Seneca and and the Stoics proud. I mean, she's like, bring me adversity, bring me challenge, and you will only make me stronger. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's such a huge learning. And she she continually challenged teams to push the ideas that they had further. I mean, there's already like a lifelong lesson in leadership, but all of that leadership chat actually produced some pretty amazing buildings. I feel like we we got to get into some of the buildings a bit. Where Where should we start on that journey? Yeah. So we have this interesting clip, really just giving a, a bit of a retrospective on many of the buildings that she's known for. And um, I would encourage all of you to make mental notes or actual notes and Google all of these, these buildings after, uh, after the show. And, and most of them, if not all of them will be in our, our show notes as well at moonshots.io. But here's a look back on Zaha's body of work. Dame Zaha Hadid designed buildings that could look as fluid as mercury while appearing as light as a leaf. Sensuous parabolic shapes became a trademark of her architectural aesthetic, leading to her being called the Queen of the Curve. Her creations were always eye-catching, often draw-dropping, and sometimes controversial. People forgot what you can do through modern work. You know, there was an obsession with historicism, a vernacular, a postmodern. So the idea of new was almost alien. Zaha Hadid was born in Baghdad and studied maths at university before moving to London in the 70s to train as an architect. She set up her own practice shortly afterwards, then found there were no takers for her avant-garde ideas. I was woman. I did strange stuff. I think they're all together intertwined. But there was definitely has been, and I still remain, it's much better now, there's a definite stigma too about the woman thing. It was this Cubist-inspired building in Germany that proved to be her big breakthrough. Soon, her ability to mix old-school craft skills with revolutionary new computer programs saw her emerge as one of the most exciting and innovative architects of her generation. I think she has added an enormous amount of language to architecture. She, she's devised shapes that we never thought that we could do, or never thought that any architect could do. Uh, and that is something, you know. There's a lot of architecture that is a sort of variant on the architecture that's come before. But she did... She did shapes that gobsmacked you. Her visual flamboyance proved popular abroad, but less so in the UK, her adopted home, where she really only made her mark on the public's consciousness with her aquatic centre for the 2012 London Olympics. To be accepted as a, an architect, I think is, I'm not sure it's fully done. Not here, not in this country. I'm still considered to be on the margin, you know, despite all these things. And I don't mind being on the edge, actually. It's a good place to be. She had a reputation for being short-tempered and difficult, while some of her buildings were criticised for being impractical and overblown. There's no doubt she was uncompromising, a characteristic that allowed her to overcome prejudice and scepticism to design some truly remarkable buildings for which she received multiple awards. Dame Zaha Hadid was a trailblazing visionary. She leaves behind an extraordinary body of work to be marvelled at by generations. Happy on the edge, Chad. I mean, everything we were saying in the leadership, she's like, yeah, I've done some amazing things. And yet the Brits, they still haven't quite accepted me as an architect. I guess that puts me on the edge. That's fine by me. I mean, is she just the ultimate obstacle is the way, I mean, we don't have a better example than this. Yeah. And like very punk too. Yes. Like I, I, I think kind of her, her age is, her age was, you know, of such a time where especially in Britain, like, I guess she moved in the seventies, you know, which was really the, the rise of the punk era. Like there's, there's a bit of punk in her as well that I think is really interesting and quite contrasting to, to many or most of, of the people that we've profiled here. But as, as we've learned, it's really served her well. Yeah. And, um, so often we search as humans for being accepted by the center. Um, yet what her success has been rooted in is not being in the center, but mm-hmm. being on the edge and thinking wildly differently. And and you just need to look at her buildings and you're like, you, you, I'm just searching on Google as we talk here. I'm looking at these places and 
they are there that I mean the formula is that she thought differently. It's not even like, you know, you look at Foster and to a lesser extent Geary and you can see a certain signature styling. I mean, I look at Zaha and sometimes they're curves, sometimes they're angles, sometimes they're tall, sometimes they're small. Like the variety of this punk architecture is breathtaking. And and it does feel like you're somehow transported onto the set of Blade Runner. I mean, the future is now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the buildings that put her on the map here in the US was a contemporary art center she built in Cincinnati. We have a clip with Zaha talking to Charlie Rose. And what's really interesting is how she was trying to bring the urban scape into the building. Uh, so as you were moving through the building, it kind of brought the urban landscape inside of it. But uh, let's get to Zaha and Charlie talking about the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. So what's the challenge here? You're at the, first of all, you're an artist and you love contemporary art. Mm -hmm. yes? yes. So this is interesting because you're going to design a building in which there is an engagement yes. between somebody who comes to this public building, the mm -hmm. Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, and art. And more than that, this is interesting, mm -hmm. because you want to, the curator, the head of director, wants to create a building where artists will design, will right. create art for the building. For the building, yes. Which has to do with space. I mean, what is interesting about this building is not a collecting museum. It's a yeah. borrowing museum, right, basically. Right. Uh, that means that... I mean, they're running quite, exhibitions in yeah. and out. Uh, it means that they need tremendous flexibility on one hand, but they also need an identity, you know, uh, as a kind of a, as a figure. Uh, also, I think, I think that these, uh, all these projects need a, a civic aspect, which you say, what does it do for the city? What is right. the feedback to the city? And therefore, this project was seen as, the ground floor, for example, is seen as a really, an extension of civic space in the city. So you can enter the museum, you can sit down, have lunch, whatever, right. and you don't have to really, you can only pay if you have to pay when you go to the back of the building. Um, also, what we thought about is how, because of these two possibilities of potentials of flexibility and specificity about because of entity and identity, how these could be seen as space which could be pre-designed sometimes. It's almost like a kit right. of how you can have very small spaces which may be there with a projection, right. installation, to very vast spaces with a very show, big show. Uh, that is, I mean, I really love hearing how she thought about that building because it contributed to all the different stakeholders that she mentioned, but mm -hmm. it was like a, a, a starter kit, a canvas, a platform for the artists themselves. And if I remember the story correctly, the curator had not been hired when she built the building. So mm -hmm. she really, in, in, in effect, was the curator. So what happened is she had to think of a space that would serve and inspire artists and within that, doing that job, it needed to serve not only the people that came to the city or came to the space, but all the people inside the city. You get the sense of this dialogue that the building is between all these different stakeholders. And you get a sense of the complexity of thought that goes into making what some people might think, well, you just make a building. But there's such a bigger conversation, a bigger idea around the building. Yeah. And I think. Zaha was a big proponent of, hey, let's take a look at not just the, the quote unquote client who's, you know, the board of the museum. Let's take a look at all of these users and how can we make this a space that's not only a great experience for patrons who are going to the museum, but the artists that are creating exhibits specifically for that space, for, for Cincinnati, the city. And in so in so many more. So she kind of she broadened the the, the view or the, the to address as many users as possible to really make the building as successful as it could be because it's speaking to so many needs, which I can only imagine is a really hard thing to do. Yeah. But I think it's it, it, it I'm sure it's a big contributing factor to why her buildings are so successful, so well trafficked, so well received by not only the direct clients, but the cities in which they're built. You know, there's cities that were clamoring for for her to build in their cities because of how active and activated these these built environments were. 
Yeah, and which takes us back to Geary, who was the first to really do this when he did Bilbao. Um, they now talk about the Bilbao effect, which is when an architect creates such a signature piece that it transforms the local neighborhood environment and community and regenerates it through a, just a big dose of inspiration. Um, and Zaha has followed uh, and expanded on that idea dramatically. And I, I just think, you know, to kind of wrap up our indulgence in, in her architectural wonders, I just say go on to Google, put in Zaha Hadid Best Buildings, and it is a visual feast, isn't it, Chad? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm just looking at it right here and I'm just like... Yeah, both you and I are just... I, yeah, we, we have like six tabs open each on different buildings. I know, I know what's on your browser tab right now because <laughs> I'm, I'm staring at the same incredible photography as well. Yeah. Um, but you touched on this earlier, Mike. It's There's so much behind the architecture and the, and the thinking and mental models that I think allows her to, to cr come up with and create such big and, and grand ideas fundamental to that is this idea of not believing in compromise. So she, she goes out to the edge and stays there and just simply doesn't compromise. So here's her talking about just that. I don't like the word compromise uh, to start with. <clears throat> because, you know, I think that, um, you know, we know we are kind of professional and we know that in every project you have to be quite uh, kind of um, smart in the way you can interpret the work to suit the client or the requirements or the requirements of the city or planning or whatever it is. Uh, I've known for a long time that as long as I maintain the ideas, the central idea to the project, and I can adjust the work to suit, then I think... It's not, it's not in compromise. Sometimes, in some cases, actually, it, it makes the work better uh, if, you, if you have to go around a certain problem. Uh, you know, so I think there is always a demand to... I, th I think for a long time, people did not respect the profession of architecture, and it was seen as a service, and it was like the duty of the architect to always kind of dumb down the idea. But I think you can still maintain the central idea but you can, you can make it work. Now, what was really interesting about her comments about going around problems can make projects better is I don't even know if she realizes, but her, her specific thinking as to an architectural project directly mirrors her whole life philosophy hmm. of being stoic, living on the edge, being tougher through adversity that directly comes back in her work. She says, actually facing the challenges with the clients and the constraints, this actually makes the work better. Mm. I, I'm not even sure if she realizes it, but it's a huge correlation. Yeah. Who knew that this would become this, the stoicism show here with Zaha Hadid? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's I've, it's funny. I mean, I, you, you're helping me draw that connection too, Mike, because I don't think I it clicked until until you just said it. This idea, I mean, this is something that I really want to get better at and take home with me and work on is to, there's also an element of simplicity in, in what she's saying. She's, she's saying, if you can find and hold on to the central idea, kind of everything on the edge is, you know, you can figure out how to overcome, but as long as that central idea is really executed upon, then you know, then your brave idea is kind of safe from being watered down. She's like a perfect example of, you know, how we can not water down ideas. The way she works and the way she thinks is completely antithetical to, you know, the constant chipping away or the watering down of ideas, which is kind of like the reality or in most places in the reality of how most of us think about mm. doing our work. Mm. Uh, we, you know, it's like, well, I don't have enough time or I don't have enough capacity or, well, we don't have enough for research or we're not really interested in taking that big shot. If we all just kind of stuck to our guns, so to speak, as, uh, as Zaha did, maybe, uh, maybe there would be some more moonshots out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think what goes hand in hand with 
you know, solving problems, working within the constraints, holding on to the ideas, particularly in a craft that is both art and science, is the act of learning and the act of teaching. And um, remarkably enough, this next clip, this is Zaha sort of getting our heads now into like, well, how do you grow your skills and behaviors in this ultimate challenge? So let's have a listen to Zaha Hadid on the importance of teaching. People always think, you know, people always ask, people don't know, who, who don't, not in education, they always say, oh, you know, teaching because it gives you some ideas. Well, that's not really the reason you're teaching. I think it's a very reciprocal experience. And also through teaching, you can, you can test certain ideas. It's not that you want to test them, it's not, they're not like a student's and guinea pigs, but you certain certain ideas which are very suitable in terms of education to test certain things. I don't believe only in the kind of, um, I believe in a, not only in a kind of a metaphysical project or metaphoric, but more uh, a project where it eventually could be achieved as a, as a building. And I think it was very important for me when I was a student that this idea of pushing certain ideas which seem quite extreme uh, to the mainstream uh, was the most important. So I think testing and these ideas in schools are, are very exciting and, and I, I believe also that people in the profession should also teach because there, there should not be this big gap between the student body and the profession. Uh, they're not two, they're not necessarily two worlds. The realm of ideas and the realm of practice should be very similar or connected. And that's why I like teaching. Hmm. So we've often hear people that we've profiled, Mike, talk about their learning practice or the importance of, of lifelong learning. Hmm. I like hmm. Zaha's addition to this in that she's kind of looking at it from the other direction and saying, well, the, the teaching part is important because it's not just about theory. You know, so we can learn all day and learn all the theory, but if you're not putting it into practice, then, then it can get lost. And so it, it's interesting. And I think she's also kind of saying that she learns best through teaching because she can throw out these wild and crazy ideas to her students and kind of see what they do with them. So maybe some of them take, take those ideas and run with them. And she's like, Oh, okay. So this, thing that was only like an idea or theory in my head, I infected my students with this idea and they went off and actually, you know, a few of them were able to pull it off. So it's, it's an interesting way for her to kind of test out her ideas at scale uh, with, with her students. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah. And I love, she, she gave a little uh, uh, reference that teaching is reciprocal. Mm. And I, I thought that was really neat because it's certainly a theme for me is that if you want to learn something, teach it. And inside of that means if you're going to teach it, you need to know what you're talking about. So I really, really like that. And, and I like the way that teaching for her is constant prototyping of new ideas, not of new theories alone, but theories that could eventuate in practical ideas, buildings that could get made. Mm. So you can kind of see this huge learning engine that builds up with her because she pushes to the edge. She stays there. She's not compromising out there and she's always learning on the edge. Um, and I, I, th I can just imagine the sort of the industry that she created um, as an individual just through that sheer force of those practices. Yeah. And I see academia as a, almost kind of like a user testing ground or like a prototyping ground for her. Mm. So it, that, that is much faster than the professional side. All architects know that building grand buildings just takes a lot of time. You got to find a client, you got to design it, you got to be sure it can be engineered, then you have to build it, then you have to, you know, be sure that it meets spec and then finally people can occupy it. And for some buildings or or built environments, it can be like 10 years, you know, if you're building a new medical school campus or a hospital or something. But Zaha has kind of found like a hack where she's been teaching for, I think she said her entire professional career, like as soon as she graduated school, she turned around and started teaching. She can just test out her ideas in front of students mm -hmm. and she gets immediate mm -hmm. feedback, you know, kind of within the semester, she'll see what studio projects um, her students are doing and she can get that very rapid feedback. I mean, I am now trying to figure out how I can get back into teaching so that I can throw out some <laughs> wild and crazy ideas to get that feedback. Yeah. Um, 
is um, I, I think uh, hopefully our listeners know at this point, you and I are a bit addicted to uh, that user feedback oh, yeah. uh, when it when it comes to the products and services and stories that that we're that we're creating together. Yeah, this using academia as this kind of prototyping of ideas environment really fascinating to me. Yeah, very, very, very energizing. And what's particularly important here is what I take away as an entrepreneur is to be in perpetual testing, like never get too comfy with the status quo, always be testing, get new insights, get new learnings, fail a little bit, learn a little bit. And I'm sure that ended up being such a great source Mm. of her inspiration because you look at her portfolio of work and it is breathtaking. It's not like she's got one hit. I mean, she's just back to back. Everything is just dramatic, futuristic, jaw dropping. It is an, an incredible body of work, but you know, that learning process was the key technique. But we wouldn't be signing off the show if we didn't come back to her signature behavior. I mean, we got the learning thing down. We got going to the edge down. But I think, Chad, we might have a clip that really speaks to the heart of Zaha Hadid, don't you? Yeah. This relentless, gritty perseverance through adversity, which, you know, has forged this incredible creative uh career of hers yeah here's here's a great clip uh from zaha talking about how to turn our weaknesses into strengths Uh, but they do i think the world generally needs women in it uh because they do have a different view i had no um sort of um, a a role model sort of speak uh as a woman you know for women so so, and also, I didn't have to really be like all the others because I'm not a man and, and, and so on. So that gave me a lot of freedom mm-hmm. and, and, and liberated me, you know, and that was really important. But of course, the, on the other hand, that same, the other problem occurs is that you have, a, you know, the people don't, at the time, uh, they're not think women can do certain things, which, which is also stupid. Mm-hmm. I mean... Um, I think they just, I think you have to, I think through knowledge and skill, you begin to have more confidence. Mm-hmm. And that, I think it's the confidence that allows you to persevere, persevere mm-hmm. in that world. Okay. I mean, you know, I think that women are still marginalized, uh, but um, it's much better. Mm-hmm. But it's still quite difficult. I mean, um, I think that, I mean, I find now that lots of women in my office who uh, they go out and have children, they do come back and they work very hard and, 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 and say they're okay. I think when they're out for too long, it becomes more prone to continuity. Mm-hmm. I think the continuity in, in architecture is a big problem. Mm-hmm. You know, you are out of sync or with your colleagues, you don't know what's going on exactly, so mm-hmm. you need to kind of... Mm-hmm. you know, uh, work harder. And that's what I did. I worked harder than anybody else. Not so that people can take me more seriously, just because the work I wanted to do required so much more research mm-hmm. and re- resolution that I had to really work. We all worked very hard. Work hard and then work <laughs> harder. <laughs> and you can only do that if you're doing what you love. And yeah, that is one thing I know for sure. Like you can't manufacture a false commitment. You know, It just doesn't, doesn't last. But for me, Chad, you know, my, I find it so exciting to look at her work. I'm a big fan of uh, Blade Runner and um, I feel like I'm, uh, like Blade Runner has entered today. When I look at these buildings, it is really exhilarating because you you do have this sense looking at her work like, oh my gosh, I could not have imagined that as a building. And that's, I don't know, there's a real gift in that. But what a gift in, in seeing her, her resilience and how she's made every challenge something that's just made her stronger and and throughout that process, she's always been learning and testing new ideas and pushing edges. 
oh my gosh. I mean, I'm just, I'm so pumped. I have to go back to the gym now. I'm, I'm, I'm all pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about you? Dave? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, I did a, a bit of cursory research on most of her buildings. Now I just want to do a lot of in-depth research on all of her buildings and, and, you know, make excuses to my wife to go on trips to, to be able to see them but, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright's and, and Norman Foster's and, and Frank Gehry's that that's the fun part about this series is, you know, we can go and visit sometimes in our own cities, buildings that have been created by, by these individuals in profiling innovators that are working in the built environment and, and at this kind of scale, it's, it's really interesting. You know, it's not, it's not to say that, you know, building rockets and electric cars in the solar futures, not also are really, uh, incredible things to be doing, but, um, the, the parallels to all of the previous innovators that we've talked about, is just something that was a bit unexpected for me, uh, in talking about architecture. It's, you've got to be in touch with the users. You've got to stick to your bold ideas. You've got to test, you know, it's, it's many of this, the same, many of the same things, just a, just a slightly different product. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, um, who would have imagined that Zaha Hadid had so much, uh, to give us quite epic and, um, but, but puts us on a great course for our final architect, uh, for our next show, Chad, do you want to kind of prime that and tell everyone what we've got coming? Yeah. So we're rounding out the series with Bjark Ingels of big, the Bjark Ingels group. If, if that doesn't, uh, signal a bit about his, uh, ego, mm-hmm. I am not mm-hmm. sure what would, but he's a very interesting, I think he's one of the best salespeople for architecture kind of to, to the public, just Google his name and you'll find kind of his pitch videos for some of their projects. And, uh, he is able to, to put a really fascinating and interesting narrative around the buildings that they're building. So yeah, I'm really excited because he's kind of a blend of my flavor of storytelling with architecture. And I think, uh, we'll be able to learn a lot, uh, from looking at him and what he and his, his team have, have built. Yeah. He's, he's done some amazing things. Also some adversity in his story when he started he, a lot of his architecture was born out of the fact that the first projects had very small budgets. Mm -hmm. And so he was ingenious in finding workarounds that then kind of led him onto this breakthrough set of, of work. And he has risen very, uh, very fast to, to the higher ranks of architects. So that's going to be, that's going to be wonderful. Um, and, uh, yeah. And a connection to, um, a company that we've talked about here on the show, WeWork. Yeah, um, he's recently tapped as 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 kind of chief entrepreneur or a chief architect in in residence for for WeWork. So yeah, I think WeWork probably could have had their choice of any architect, mm-hmm. and why they chose him. You know, we just have to tune into the next show to find out what was so interesting about him and his work uh, that a company like WeWork would would snatch him up. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I hadn't heard about that deal. That's that's fascinating. Well, um, we have to remind all of our listeners, if you want any of the notes, links, uh, if you want to watch, listen to any of our archives, head off to moonshots.io where you'll get all the goodies. You can get our newsletter. Uh, Don't forget to uh, jump into the iTunes podcast universe and leave us uh, a review. Um, We're really, really thankful for all the reviews that we've had. And we'd, we'd just love to encourage those of you who are enjoying the show, get in there, tell us what you think, um, share it, um, uh, spread the word. And if you want any of the goodies, just head to moonshots.io and you'll, you'll find everything you could possibly want, want from our back catalog chat of 50 episodes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 50 shows, Mike. I don't want to let that pass without uh, giving us a small pat on the back. I, I look forward to recording many, many more shows with you, Mike. And um, for all you listeners out there, everything we've talked about on today's show and more links, photos, documentaries, everything you can find at moonshots.io. I saw a couple new uh, iTunes reviews come in uh, since our last show. And so I just wanted to ask all of you, well, thank you to all of you who have left a review. Uh, It makes a big difference in the discoverability of the show. 
And um, yeah, just hop in there, leave us a review. And if you, uh, if you go above and beyond and write a little something about the show, maybe one of your favorite episodes or one of your favorite insights or, or learnings, Mike or I, or, or both of us will read those out in future episodes. Um, but yeah, we, we want to thank you for taking the time to leave reviews for the show. Absolutely. So thank you to you, Chad. Thank you to all of our listeners. Really excited to jump into the next show with Bjark Engels. That's a wrap for Zaha Hadid, and that's a wrap for everything today. We'll see you next time.